Well, if we get our thing going here, our projector and stuff, we're going to look at this idea of the sons of Dodo. How many of you ever heard anybody preach about the sons of Dodo? You did? Okay, there's a few of you here that may have heard something about the sons of Dodo. I'm going to go through this pretty fast here, not take a lot of time. It's just a a, a thing that I saw a number of years ago and would like to try to uh, make an impression on you with it, something that would stay with you when you read these stories. David was hiding in a cave. I don't know how many of you have been fascinated in your life with the story of David. But it just so amazes me how David was out there watching the sheep and he's taking care of the sheep and the king or the the prophet comes and to see his dad and they have a big feast and a big party and David stays out with the sheep and he brings all of his son and sons in front of the prophet and the prophet says it's not this one it's not this one it's not this one it's not this one so they circle them all back around again not this one not this one finally he says you have any more sons well you got that one out there with the sheep. So he says, bring him here. So they bring him in, and he's and, and God says, this is the one. And the prophet takes and pours a, a horn of oil on his head. And and I don't know what that did to David. But he goes back out to watch his sheep. And from the sheep, he comes into a scene where he's taking sandwiches to his brothers. David didn't go out to fight Goliath. He went out to take sandwiches. Goliath just got in the way. And he goes out there to take the sandwiches and the scene happens with Goliath and, and the Israel has a mighty victory over their enemies and when the people come back in, they're having celebrations and shouting and saying, Saul, which is the established king, has killed his... And David has killed his... And the people made an automatic judgment call that the anointing and the authority of God has left Saul and gone on to another person. Well, David goes back out to the sheep and Saul gets depressed. And he's sitting in there with all this depression problem and they say, "What? where's somebody that can fix this? And so they send for David and David comes in there and David is, is so much in connection with God. You talk about a single person, a sing, somebody who is single and is still completely sexually fulfilled, if you please, in a oneness with God. That, David was there. And he's so connected with God that when he bows his head and he begins to play on his harp and, and play to the Lord God of heaven, what comes out of that harp is so anointed that it drives away evil spirits. And he plays in his harp and it drives evil spirits away. And one day Saul is looking at him and recognizing this guy is going to take all the anointing and everything off of me. And so he pulls out his javelin and throws it at David and David ducks and then he starts running. And that starts a scene in David's life where he's in and out of the palace. Sometimes he's in, sometimes he's out. And he goes out and he's hiding out in the caves. And and, and I, I just, I went over there and I went back into some of the places that it says that David hid. And I sat there, it just, it it really affected me anyway. He'd hide out there in these places. He would sit out there and hide. And Saul started this thing of, let's go hunt David. You know, so he'd get a band of guys and their horses. Instead of hunting foxes or hunting coons, they were out hunting David. (laughs) Take your camping equipment, we're going to go hunt David for a couple days. So they go out through there and they're having a hunting David party. And they're hunting to kill. And all the women in town are telling their children, don't be naughty. You need to listen to your daddy because if you don't, you're going to end up like David. And David's name was a byword. David's name was almost a cuss word in Israel. He was disrespected and hated. If Saul wanted 3,000 men to go hunt David, he had no problem coming up with 3,000 guys that would leave their home to go out and hunt David and try to kill him. Then something would happen and David would be back in Saul's good graces again and pretty soon he'd throw a javelin at him and he's back out there again running for his life. Running to the Philistines, running to the Moabites, running everywhere he can, building a camp out there, just everywhere that he can go out there, running for his life. Now in this scene, I want you to picture this scene. In here is the capital city and Saul is in there. And he's got this great big palace 
And he has all these servants. And he is the king. And out there in the wilderness, hiding somewhere way out in the bush, starving, running around like a dog, is David. And you come along. And you are 22 years old. And everybody around you knows that they should not mess with you. And everybody in your village knows that if some of the Amalekites come through and they start going through here and stealing cows and chickens, call Joe. Because Joe is going to come over there with a sword and he's going to start hacking him some people and the Amalekites will learn better than to come back again. So you are known all around as a mighty man of valor. And Saul's captain of his army comes and talks to you and says, We need you to come in here as one of our generals. And one day when mom and dad wake up, you're gone. And you've taken your little backpack and you've taken your shield that you made with your own hands and your knife that you made with your own hands and your sword and you disappeared walking out across the desert to go and attach yourself to David. To attach yourself to what is despised and rejected and hunted like an animal. Somebody tell me, why would you do that? Then Samuel took a horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. The Spirit of the Lord came down upon David. The Spirit of the Lord came down and sat on him. So there's Samuel anointing uh, David with oil. And of course, the scene goes forward. Well, now here's what the Bible says about this. Everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt... And everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them and there were with him about 400 men. Now you talk about a motley crew. These were the guys that actually went out there and attached themselves to David. People that were discontented, in distress and in debt. And yet somehow in the middle of that, there were some men, mighty men of renown, whose shoulders went back and they said, I choose that. I want to tell you, back in that day, if you were a Philistine and you woke up and these three guys were looking at you, you were fixing to have a bad day. David had three mighty men, and I'm going to read to you about these three mighty men. After him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite. And we're talking today about sons of Dodo. After him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel ran away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword and the Lord wrought a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was Shema the son of Agi the Herite and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop and there was a piece of ground full of lentils and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines and the Lord wrought a great victory. And the three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time into the cave of Dulam and the trope of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. So David is sitting up on the side of a mountain in a stronghold where nobody can get to him. And he's sitting up there and a whole bunch of Philistines gathered together down in the valley around the city of Bethlehem. And David's sitting up there in that hold and he's looking down there and he sees the enemies of God running roughshod over God's people. 
And he sat up there and looked down and he said, I'd like to have a drink. David was in an hold and the garrison of the Philistines was in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men said, Did you hear that? And three mighty men broke through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. <coughs> Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out into the Lord. And I want you to think, can you two guys stand up? I want you guys to think a little bit about what this looked like. That there was come out here like this. You're going to go over here like this. And you're going to act like you're getting ready to fight. And you're going to go over here like this. And you're going that way. And over here was another guy going this way. And we're going to move down the aisle together a little bit, okay? All the way through the troop of the Philistines like this. Anybody comes from this side, this man is trusting his life to me. He can't defend his back. I'm there. And I'm trusting my life to him because I can't defend my back. And he's there. And both of us are trusting our life to him. And we can't defend our back. You follow what I'm saying? And yet together, the three of them went right through the middle of a thousand Philistines got a thing of water and came back again. Now you got to go this way. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And they brought this, you can sit down again. They brought this water back and they handed it to David. And David comes out there and he looks down in their Philistines and they're carrying bodies out. And there's a trail of devastation right through the middle of them. And these guys come and said, hey, didn't you say you wanted a drink? And I'm asking you, what kind of a man is that? And a long, long time ago, I started asking myself, how does a man, how does a man raise sons like that? David pours the water out. The name Eliezer means, it's a combination of two words. Strength or almighty. Azar means surround, protect, aid, and help. This represents a son who is strong when it comes to protecting, aiding, and helping the father. These sons faithfully stand with the father when others forsake him. They are the last ones still standing with him. They are the sons who do not tire easily. And they serve the Father and the agenda of the kingdom until the physical, emotional, and spiritual stamina is completely exhausted. First Chronicles tells the story again and says, After him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, who was one of the three mighties. He was with David at Pasadamim, when the Philistines were gathered together to battle and there was a parcel of ground full of barley and the people fled from before the Philistines and they set themselves in the midst of that parcel and delivered it and slew the Philistines and the Lord saved them by a great deliverance. You know how to make a guy really, really, really seriously dangerous in a battle? Convince him that he can't die. And I think that one day David woke up persuaded that he couldn't die. And the Philistines came together and said, we're going to take this thing of barley. And David said, oh yeah? Over my dead body. And he began to fight and jab and whatever he did all day long. Somewhere in the middle of this thing, it began to occur to him, nobody's hitting me from the back. Nobody's coming around behind him. Come up here. And when he turned around, he saw another man doing the same thing. 
Now, if you put yourself in that kind of a position where you are fighting for a field of barley, for crying out loud. Well, the thing is, David just said, it's not a good day for me to give up a field of barley. It's not a good day for me to give, I don't want to give up that field of barley. You understand what I mean? And so he's going to fight with it. And he starts fighting for it. And somewhere in the middle, he realizes that all of his friends have fled. And he's standing alone fighting. But nobody's coming from behind. And he turns around and he sees one guy has planted himself there. And he is under no illusions about giving up. And he fights with every ounce of strength he has all day. And at the end of the day, the Bible says... He couldn't let go of his sword. They had to literally come and pry his fingers one at a time off of his sword. What makes a man like that? What does it take to produce a son of Dodo? I wonder what kind of a father Dodo was. I wonder what kind of a father he was. That when his son had an option, do I take fame and fortune before the king or do I run around like a dog hunted in the wilderness and connect with the Spirit of God? He turned directly against the fame and he turned toward the Spirit of God. And when he went out there and he learned to fight and he saw the Spirit of God on David, he attached himself to that and said, whatever you desire, I will lay down my life for. That's some serious leadership going on there. And it's some serious authority behind that sword. That's what I said. If you're a Philistine and you woke up one day and those three guys are walking into your town, you're fixing to have a bad day. Because at the end of the day, they're still going to be alive and they're going to walk out. What does it take to raise a son of Dodo? What does it take to be a... And what does it take to be Dodo? To teach children, to teach young men growing up the difference between the power of a system and the power of the spirit. Where they will turn on their heel away from everything this world has to offer and turn toward the spirit of God. And what does it take to be that kind of a man ourselves? Sons of Dodo. Stand up with me if you would. God, you're King of kings and Lord of lords, and you know, Heavenly Father, everything. You know the end from the beginning. And God, we don't understand a lot of things about the times we live in or even who we are or what we're supposed to be doing. But Father God, we want to say to you today that we believe in you and that we prize the anointing of your Holy Spirit beyond anything that is established and glamorous. And Father, we want to turn our heart toward you and toward our sons and, and even our own heart toward, toward learning to fight in such a way that we would be considered before you to be mighty warriors who will in no way abandon you or your cause at any time and to whom whatever you wish becomes our command and we lay down our life for it. If you would all as a congregation pray with me. Heavenly Father, Father, teach us. us, O Father, Father, mighty Father, Father, good Father, Father, teach us us to be sons. sons. Teach us to be your sons. Sons Sons like the sons of Dodo. Dodo. Mighty men of renown. renown. And O O God, give us courage. Give us the inner strength and the inner reality to raise in our leadership sons who will stand like those mighty men. 
who were around David, who were around David. And, who you, and who prefer you and your Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit. To, everything to everything that this world, that this world and, its and its systems have to offer. Have to offer. We, worship you, we worship you, God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated.